Good morning. We're glad that you're here on Friends and Family Day as we start off Friends and Family Day. And if you're uh, just arriving, just come on in and have a seat. You know, Friends and Family Day is something that we've had the last several years, and it's always an enjoyable day. So we hope that uh, if this is your first Friends and Family Day, you'll take advantage of all the really uh, fun things going on. Uh, please stay for lunch uh, after services are over. There'll be plenty of food. Uh, if you haven't brought anything, that is okay. I'm sure most everybody has followed the rule of potluck, which is uh, bring enough for you and another family. So that's usually the way that works. So we're just, we just hope you'll stay and we can get to know you a little better and spend some time enjoying uh, one another's company. Also at 4.30 tonight, uh, the hay rides will begin. If you like hay rides, which I do, uh, they'll start about 4.30, they'll last till 5.30, and then we'll have a, a Devo by the bonfire and some singing, and then uh, we'll also have some uh, food trucks show up, popcorn and our kettle corn and donuts and cider and coffee and all that cool stuff. And then about dark 30, we're going to start a movie. And uh, if you want to know what the movie is, I don't know. If you find out, you tell me, because I have no idea what the movie is, but uh, it's something that Evan has picked out from children's ministry, and every year it's just been a really good movie, and it's just so much fun to sit outdoors in our lawn chairs on the football field and enjoy some time together watching a movie. So uh, we hope that you'll participate and take part in all the, the fun stuff that'll be going on today. Before we begin our class, let's, let's pray together. God, you're an amazing God, and we're so grateful for your blessing, uh, knowing that your true blessing is you yourself. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you continue to show this love for us. Lord, as we talk about families, and for the next several weeks we're going to talk about family, uh, allow us to remember that there is no perfect family, and that as we shoot for the ideal, so many times we'll miss but it's pressing toward this ideal that brings dignity to our world. Father, we love you. We thank you for your son and what he's shown us about being family, the way he's shown us that we're important. And Father, we pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. And amen. You ever had your moment? Uh, fathers, mothers, children have their moments. Uh, being a part of a family is uh, wonderful, it's a blessing, and it can be stressful, and it can be tough, it can be all of those things. There are, there are a couple of things that are true about every family and about everyone in a family. And Number one, we all come from a family. Everybody here comes from a family of some sort. And the second one is, you don't get to choose your family. 99.9% .9 of the time, you're not going to get to choose who you end up being a family with uh, for the remainder of your life. And I don't know if you're like I am. Uh, I grew up watching television and, and saw all these, these television shows, and it's like, man, I'd love to be part of that family. You know, and, and you could think about all these family sitcoms where it's like, man, the, the dad is so cool or the mom. And, and I had a friend, actually, that uh, his name was Robert. And I used to love to hang out with Robert and hang out at his house because his dad was awesome and his mom was cool. And they all got along and it was great. And uh, I'm sure it was a show because people have stress. Uh, which one of these families might you identify with? First one I'm going to throw up there is the Brady Bunch. You ever remember the old Brady Bunch? Maybe you're beautifully blended. Two families that have been brought together uh, by, by God's grace, uh, and you push all these people all in one family, and you try to make it work. Maybe that's your family. Or... <laughs> Maybe your family is uh, the Huxtables. I know we don't see a lot of Cosby anymore, uh, but you remember that show, how that there was this constant chaos going on, but there was still that semblance of control. Maybe your family is controlled chaos. Uh, if you're like me, you identify with this next family, the Beverly Hillbillies. Yeah, you know, kind of rough around the edges, but the truth is they all love one another and they figure out a way to make it work. 
Or lastly, probably one of the families that most people identify with are the Simpsons, happily dysfunctional families. Family can mean a variety of things. And, you know, when we come together for Friends and Family Day, a lot of people think that we believe as Christians that families are are the father, mother, 2.3 kids with the wood grain station wagon. And that's not what families are. Uh, families can be a lot of different things. You can have blended families. Uh, you have step families. You have foster families. You have families, actually, if you're alone and you're trying to find your way in the world, you yourself are a family, and we want you to connect as well, too. Uh, there, there are all kinds of families in this world. And so what I want you to know is no matter what type of family you are, whether you're blended, whether it's a step family, whether you're just trying to make it work, you're a single parent household, no matter what family you're a part of, God has a plan for your family. God loves you. He loves your mom, your dad, your children. God has a plan for your family. Now, I'm a firm believer, you know, very often we find new people who will come to Clear Creek. And as Clear Creek's family, I'm a firm believer that God brings people into this family for a reason, because God has a plan for this family. But there's a truth that can't be ignored, and that's that all families carry with them the ability to give great joy or to bring great pain. And if you're part of a family, you more than likely will experience both things. You'll experience times of, of mountaintop joy, and then you'll experience times of, of low valley pain. The thing is to try to level that off so that there'll be less pain and, and more joy and that, that your life can be uh, ideal in the sight of God. The problem we have there is when we get into Scripture and we start looking for ideal families, there aren't any. That's true. You just go from, from Genesis to the maps, and you're not going to find ideal families. You're going to find all kinds of families. You're going to find families that are rough around the edges. You're going to find happily dysfunctional, but you will not find that ideal family. And just some examples from the Old Testament. Um, biblical families. First one's Adam and Eve. You're thinking, well, was Adam and Eve? Yeah, Adam and Eve was a family. They, they were created in the garden, and Adam made the horrible mistake of choosing a woman over God, which men still do today, don't they? And, and, and so the, the train starts rolling downhill from there, and they have two sons, Cain and Abel. And it doesn't take even a generation for the ultimate crime to be committed on the face of the earth as Cain kills his brother, Abel, out of a fit of jealousy. And we go on further, we have Abraham. Abraham, a man whose righteousness was, re or whose uh, faith was reckoned as righteousness. But we also know the story of Sarah and Hagar. And how that they were promised that they would have a child, but years and years and years had passed. And finally Sarah said, take my handmaiden. And Abraham said, that sounds like a good idea. You know, a Sarah had offered... Hagar to Abraham because she loved him. Abraham should have rejected Hagar because he loved Sarah. But that's not what happened, is it? And they have a son, Hagar and Abraham. His name's Ishmael. And then finally, the promise of God comes through for Abraham and Sarah. They have a son named Isaac. And Scripture tells us that Ishmael constantly harassed Isaac. And it got to the point where somebody had to leave. And Hagar and Ishmael were forced out of the family. Not something I would call a traditional ideal situation. And then we get to, to Isaac and his family and Rebekah. And Isaac and Rebekah had two sons. One's name was Esau and one's name was Jacob. And Isaac loved Esau. And we're going to talk about that in our sermon this morning, the, which the series is about the family of Isaac. Isaac loved Esau, but Rebekah, she loved Jacob. And there was some trickery that went on. Isaac was defrauded. Esau was defrauded of his birthright. Not necessarily the ideal family. And then as Jacob goes through his life, he has 12 sons. One of them's name is Joseph. The other 10 want to kill him. 
And so they throw him in a hole, sell him to gypsies, and go tell dad that he died. Not really an ideal family. You know, even in the New Testament, we find the family of Jesus. And we, we look at the family of Jesus and what his family was like, and we know that there was a time that his family showed up and tried to, to get him to go back with them because they thought Jesus was insane. There are no ideal families in Scripture. But let's talk just a minute. What is the biblical ideal? If there were an ideal family, what is this biblical ideal? It's kind of interesting. The Apostle Paul probably shaped family in Scripture more than anyone else, and it's ironic because the Apostle Paul was never married. But the Apostle Paul, as he goes to these new churches that are being established in these Gentile lands, basically he calls them to a model of family which was not just unusual, it was something that had never really been practiced before um, before this time. He called them to a marriage of faithfulness. One man, one woman. Well, the Gentiles certainly had never heard of anything like this, and the Jews had never really practiced anything like this. But Paul says, and from the beginning, that's what God wanted from our lives. So he goes back and he says, faithfulness in your marriage, that is a practice of an ideal family. And then he also says, children are not possessions. They are People that are to be taught and raised and child rearing became very important uh, through the words of the Apostle Paul inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so I I wanted to list some things that I thought, you know, maybe maybe these are things that if we were going to create this ideal family, there would be a list of these things. And, And I want you to know that Paul, before I start here, Paul was staunchly opposed by the people of the day. They didn't want to live this way. And the amazing thing is because of the Spirit of God and the power of God's words, uh, families did change. It ultimately did change over time. And the words of the Apostle Paul were heeded in this uh, very interesting culture. But if I had to choose things for ideal families, I, I would choose these things. Uh, families bear one another's burdens. Uh, when, when hard times come, they stand together, and, and when someone in their family is, is having trouble, they, they deal with it. Galatians 6.2 tells us that uh, we bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. Ideal families also have mutual honor and respect. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4, we, we read these words as Paul talks about family. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you, with you and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. My, my dad loved this verse because he would get to the end of verse 3 and it, when it says, uh, obey your parents so that you will live long on the earth, he would kind of change that around and say, you either obey me or I'm not going to let you live very long. But then the next verse, fathers, don't don't provoke your children to anger, but raise them up. And and what it's saying is saying, there's this mutual respect. Children, you should respect your parents. Parents, you should respect and love your children. That's a mutual thing. And and fathers, love your children so much that instead of angering them and pushing their buttons, what you do is that you nurture them. You teach them. That's an ideal family, this mutual respect and honor. Also, families delight in one another. Um, I I don't know if you have children in your family. Uh, I had a brother, and my brother and I were only 16 months apart, and I'm the runt of the family. And so I was picked on a lot, and and of course I would pick back, and brothers would go back and forth. But when something good happened with my brother or something good happened with me, we were each other's biggest cheerleader. And that's the way family should be. We should be people that really delight in the relationship that we have with one another. Delight in your children, parents. You know, I I know raising children is difficult, and like the video earlier, it can be really stressful. But Psalm 127 tells us this. It says, behold, children are a gift from the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Men, delight in these children. Raise them up to where someday when you're gone, they'll have nothing but good things to say. 
because you have loved them, you've delighted in them, and they knew that they had your blessing. The next thing on the list probably would be to communicate in meaningful ways. And there's really not a lot of scripture about families communicating in meaningful ways. But I can tell you, communication is kind of that oil that greases the wheels of family. To be able to sit down and to know what's going on in one another's life, to be able to teach without destroying, we need to be able to communicate with one another in, in meaningful, meaningful ways. Empathy. You know, as we look at this list, we bear one another's burdens, we honor one another, we delight in each other, we communicate, and then we also empathize with one another. You know, I, I have ch young adult children, and uh, they are now going through many of the things that I went through as a young adult. And it's difficult. And when they come and they tell me about the things that they're going through, especially the things that I've experienced myself, it's very easy for me to sit down and say, you know, this is my story. This is how I went through this. And uh, I understand. I understand what you're going through. I probably can give you some wisdom that I learned probably the hard way, but I understand what you're going through. I can empathize with you. And Romans 12, 15 tells us this. It says that we rejoice with those that rejoice, and we weep with those who weep. We empathize with members of our family. Another thing that's part of family is we provide for one another's needs. In 1 Timothy 5, uh, we read these, says, anyone does not provide for his own, especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel or an unbeliever. And when we start talking about providing for our own, many times we think about monetary. We think about, you know, making sure that our children have shoes and clothes and they go to a, a, maybe a good school someday. And, and that, but that's not all there is to providing for your family. As a matter of fact, that's not even the most important part of providing for a family. The most important part of providing for one another is making sure that we have the emotional things that we need, that we have the spiritual things that we need. And we're not willing to provide the emotional and spiritual background for our family. Then yeah, we, we really are denying the faith because God has planted within each of us the ability and a seed to do that very thing. And we go on and family is a place for training and growing. I'm very grateful that I lived in a household that trained me, even when it was difficult to do that. They did it because they loved me, and it didn't always seem pleasant, but they did train me. We're told in Proverbs 22, 6, to train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he's old, he'll not depart from it. And lastly, and most importantly, the ideal family loves God and they love each other. You know, we, we bear one another's burdens, we have mutual honor and respect, delighting in each other, communicating in meaningful ways, empathy, providing for one another's needs, a place for training and growing. And most importantly, if you want to be an ideal Christian family, you have to love God first. And, and when I think of this, this idea, which is part of the ideal, two very similar words, I think of the story of Joshua and how the people around him were beginning to worship false gods and they were taking their families into, into spiritual slavery. And he writes these words in Joshua 24. He says, If it's disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you'll serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This is a commitment that every Christian family should make first and foremost. That we love God, and our greatest desire as a family, with all the things that we've talked about that are part of the ideal family, that we want to weave all of these things together in this tapestry that is a gift of praise to God. That our family will be a, um, a sweet aroma. That we, when God sees our family and sees who we are as individuals and who we are as a group, and as a family, that he will feel honored by us. Let us know that our lives reflect his glory. Now, that's the biblical ideal. Would it not be nice, and I've got plenty of time, I'm just amazed, I'm ahead of schedule, which is unprecedented. 
would it not be nice if everybody did what they were supposed to do? Wouldn't it be nice if every parent was a perfect parent? Wouldn't it be nice if every child was a, was a perfect child? You know, in this world, if everybody did what they were supposed to do and they were where they were supposed to be, life would go so much easier. But I have to admit also, it would be so boring. Because the truth is, this biblical ideal, this biblical perfection that we're talking about really doesn't exist in any family. Now, you may think it does. You may say, yeah, I have pieces of that. But there are always times that those ideals break down in family. We consistently fall short of the ideal. I think Jesus amplified this truth in many ways. And, and one of the things he said, and this is in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, he, he says these words, and it's kind of interesting. Uh, 27 and 28, he says, You've heard it said that you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks on a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in her heart. You're thinking, how did he weave that into this family thing? Well, I want you to see he's saying this. He's saying, you know, the law has said this, but God's desire is something more. It's something deeper. It's something bigger. And that there is this law, but there's also God's ideal. And it's very difficult to follow the ideal. It's difficult to be the ideal. And so if we're not perfect... How do we honor God? If we know that we can't always be perfect and that God has this ideal that we're just lucky if we can follow along with the law that, that comes from it, how do we honor God? How do we honor God as our family? How do we honor God as individuals? And we have to remember that despite the fact that we're not perfect, we still can be faithful. You know, Vince Lombardi once said, None of us are perfect. But if we strive for perfection, we might capture greatness. And I think as a family, we need to remember those words because it can really be applied to our families. You know, we don't have any perfect families. We're really the perfectly imperfect family. But you know, if we'll strive for perfection, if we'll strive for the ideal, what might happen is we may achieve greatness as a family. And God can be honored through that greatness. You know, last week we looked at John chapter 1, verse 14. And it was a description of who Jesus is. You know, the, the John 1 begins with, any, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And we go down to verse 14. And we read these words. It says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. The glory uh, as of the only begotten of the Father. And he says, full of grace and truth. You know, there's this, this level of truth, there's this level of the ideal, but also the reality is, is that grace is going to have to be applied because we will never, ever live up to that grace or to that ideal. And so I, it makes me ask a couple of questions, and I want you to read these questions along with me. You don't have to read them out loud or anything, but I want you to think about what these questions are really asking. The, the first question is this. Are we willing to embrace an ideal, that family that I just described? Are we willing to embrace an ideal knowing that we might not live up to it? Or are we willing to abandon the ideal and call our shortcomings normal? This is the culture we live in. And this is, a, this is something that our culture calls us to choose. Will we say, this is the ideal family and we will strive to be that so that we can achieve some kind of greatness as a family or will we just say it can't be done let's give up will you give up on your marriages will you give up on your children will you give up on your families will you throw your hands up and just walk away because it's hard or will you have the temerity it takes to say you know what i will strive for that idea knowing that I'm going to fall short, knowing that there's times I'm going to fail. It's better to do that than to just accept my shortcomings and call them normal. And then we also, when we answer that question, we say, you know, yeah, I'll strive for the ideal knowing that I might fail. 
or that I will fail. The next question is, will we embrace an ideal that we know we might live up to, uh, know we might not live up to, and experience the tension between the ideal and the real? I'm 53 years old. I, I never hide that. I look older, I know, but I'm just 53, I promise. Uh, and my mother and I have a very unique relationship. I was raised in a household with a father and mother. My father died when I was 17, and my mother and I have this very, very unique It's a relationship my, my, my wife and my children struggle to understand. And, and the reason for this is, and I, I talked to my mother about this this weekend, so I'm not talking out of school. At 53 years old, my mother still knows how to totally push my buttons. She does. Sometimes she, does, she doesn't even do it intentionally. But it's just her personality and my personality are just so different, and our, the way we view the world and God are so different that this relationship uh, it is difficult many times because she just knows how to push my buttons. And I recognize that a lot of good qualities I have I got from my mother. My mother is a wonderful woman. I love her dearly. But dude, she can push me over the edge. And so let me ask this. Do we have an ideal relationship? No. No, we don't. Do I love her? Yeah. Is it, it, will it ever be perfect? No, it never will. Because in our relationships and our families... Usually it's not the ideal that's there. We're not having these perfect, fam perfect uh, things. That our relationships are things that are not to be solved. They're just to be managed. That sometimes this relationship, because of the personalities and, and the way things are viewed, sometimes you realize that the things that are going on in your family that push you over the edge, they're not going to be solved. They're not going to turn into the ideal. The best thing you do is try to manage those to where something positive can come from your relationship. So when we start thinking about this, if, will we give up on the ideal? And if we don't give up on the ideal, how will we resolve that tension between uh, ideal and what's real? And the truth is, the way you resolve that tension is the way Jesus resolves that tension. You know, we were created perfect. Mankind was created perfect in a perfect situation. What God created was good. It was so good that he stepped back from it and said, this is good, this is very good. And then it became not good. Because of man's relationship with one another, man's relationship with God, it became not good. And as you read this story, this narrative of the Bible, it's a long story about how God's making it good again. And the way he makes it good again is the way we make our families good again. Because the gap between ideal and real can be covered with grace. The gap between ideal and real is covered with the concept that, you know what, I, I know what my child or my parent or my sister or my brother I know who they are, I know what they're about, and I know that this word family comes with a lot of different things because when we mention family, and I mentioned father, mother, sister, brother, for some of you, that comes with a story and it comes with a lot of baggage. But the truth is, if you want to, if you want to span that gap between what you consider to be ideal and what is really there, the only way to span that gap is through grace. And just remember that applying that grace is the most important thing you'll ever do. I wanted to throw this slide up on, the, on there. It's a, and striving for dignity, or striving for the ideal, is that dignity will be brought into the world. It's only when we try to span that gap that the dignity of God can be seen in our families. I want to end this class by showing you a verse, and, and when, when you think about your family, and when you think about applying grace, and you think about who you can be because of the power of the Spirit working in your family, I want you to read Peter's words in 1 Peter 3, verses 8 through 12. To sum it up, as I'm doing the sermon, we're summing it up. 
All of you be harmonious and sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called by the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. For the one who desires life, to love and to seek good days, must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good, and he must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. If you want to understand what it means to apply grace to that gap between ideal and real, I can't think of a better description than this. Be generous and kind-hearted and brotherly. Don't repay evil for evil or insult with insult. For God wants people who can show grace. It's my prayer that all of our families can receive some kind of healing because probably most of them need that. And so to end this class, let's, let's pray for Thanksgiving, for having families, and let's pray for the healing that may be needed in many of our families. Let's pray together. God, we come before you knowing that there is no ideal family. We find in Scripture that there was no ideal family, that they all struggled, they all had their problems, they all have their stuff, and the truth is we're just people trying to make it through this life. And our prayer is that we are able to show grace in our family and with our loved ones. And our prayers for healing for those relationships that may be, uh, have such a large gap between the ideal and the real. And we also thank you for our families. The love that we experience and, and for many of us that, that closeness that we all crave and how we can find it with parents and children and brothers and sisters. And Father, I pray that uh, we'll all be appreciative of that family, but I'm most appreciative of the family that you've placed us in where you're the head, and where your son is our savior. I thank you for this family, for it's in times that are hard that we, we find we need them most. Thank you for Jesus. Amen.